what since the second half really how much they've really struggled Mind. set charged with finding some stability from this guy. welcome back to the next episode of the journey of a grassroots rugby coach and today my guest is newly appointed head coach of the Bay of Plenty Volcanics for the upcoming Farrah Palmer Cup, Kyle McLean. Uh, Kyle is also the founder of The Coaching Gig. He's an ex-school teacher, and he's also worked in rugby for many years, including Bay of Plenty Rugby as a coach development officer. Uh, he's been involved with the Blackfern Sevens. He's been involved with Sevens, 15, schoolboys. Um, very long time he's been involved in the game really great guy to chat to um, if any of you have spoken to Cole before he is passionate about this game and about making coaches and players better uh, through game-based play um, which is where I spoke to Kyle a few years ago on a couple of his seminars and we've just made a connection through there wonderful to talk to could have spoke to this guy for hours and hours um, we did speak about uh, having those courageous conversations with players having an alignment with your coaching staff uh, making sure they're all going the same way um, and what, what it feels like when it doesn't. Um, also talking about connecting with the, at high performance level, understanding the motives of players, peer coaching, game-based stuff, learning content and the learning is in the content. Um, just a heap of stuff we spoke about. So if you're really into game-based play, which you should be as a coach, um, have a listen to this, get in contact with Kyle, check out his website. Um, yeah, uh, he is he is so passionate about this stuff. Like I said, we could have done about five episodes on this. But sit back, relax, take this all in. Again, give us a rating, give us a thumbs up, pass this on to whoever you think can benefit from listening to it. Um, thank you so much for your support, everybody. Uh, but, yeah, hope you enjoy this episode as much as I enjoy chatting to Kyle with the kids we yeah kids we did a lot of um peer peer teaching yep. um they got um okay if you're really old sometimes we'd get more experience with less experience and they teach each other tackling and sometimes we'd, we'd actually subtly stream them into ability too so they'd have some of the uh lesser confident kids would maybe do activities when they're walking instead of running and the more confident kids are doing it more full-on and they're stretching their skills yet um it's probably something always to reflect on, eh? Oh, he can't find it. That's a mighty shot. A mighty one, Leicester. Well, let's, um, let's make a start. Uh, so for the listeners that might not know who you are, first of all, who are you? Where are you? And what's your involvements with grassroots? And I'm going to say sport because I know what you do, not just in a rugby content. G'day, Bully. Um... Yeah, well, no one, no one will probably know who I am, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, no, my name's Kyle McLean, and I, um, yeah, my work at the moment's got my own business called The Coaching Gig, and um, set out on a mission, I guess, to support grassroots coaches and help them survive and thrive. And, uh, yeah, formerly before that, I was an ex-school teacher, taught for 10 years in primary and secondary, did uh, work for a local provincial union called Bay Penny Rugby um, in the New Zealand here. In various roles, secondary school rugby manager for a bit, um, did the academy manager role um, under Tata McMillan, who's now the Chiefs head coach and uh, and also Māori All Blacks coach. When he, when he started at Bay, I started, well, went into that role and then jumped out after a couple of years and went back to the community space and to the coach development role, which I, which I loved and still do. Um, yeah, my heart was in the community game and my heart was looking after the, the forgotten soldiers out there, mate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Often, uh, yeah, the, 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 the sporty organisations will say that they're really important people in the puzzle, but not always um, replicated through <clears throat> the support and um, resources we provide them. So I'm still on that mission. Two years uh, self-employed now, and yeah, and managed to yeah do some work with some um, national sporting organisations here in New Zealand and learning heaps and um yeah, and then so grassroots. I yeah, it's all my whole life's dedicated to that, to be honest, and um. But also, yeah, coached a, a premier team here in the Bay of Plenty and this year, and also my son's under nineteen. Into this afternoon, mate, I've got uh, the Ripper Rugby um, module starting here locally, and I'll be dad coach there, which nice. more dad facilitator to be honest. There's no coaching involved. I uh, we're just going to rock up and play, but we'll uh, make sure they all get even game time. So, <laughs> yeah, and that's it at under nine level, mate. Is 
it's it's running around having fun. Yeah, no, that's that's really good. Thanks, mate. Um, so what got you into coaching in the first place? Um, I when I was a yeah, as I said, I was a school teacher. So I started as a, a primary school teacher, um, with year five and sixes. And that first year, I coached our school school team, and we played in the local competition. And um, that's sort of how it started. I, I did a little bit when I was at university, but um, yeah, that was sort of going back a bit. And then yeah, just really loved it. Um, the same time I was I was refereeing, so I was sort of up and coming young referee and doing pretty well on that scene and and so I just chipped away and coached some young young people and got to a point where I was uh, doing pretty well with the refereeing and sort of looking to go to that next step um it was you yeah, sort of ranked number one in our province and things are going good but I um just got to a point where I uh yeah just had a guts full of it and <laughs> and actually just realized how much I loved the coaching part and I was keeping me up all, all night thinking about stuff and so then just sort of yeah stuck to that and Ever really look back, really, and probably like you, Bully. Uh, most of my daylight hours and sometimes my night night time are thinking about coaching and coaches and how we can help, you know, all that stuff. But that's how it started, mate. Back in the primary school days, and I thought I was really good because uh, our team went undefeated, and I thought, man, I'm a good coach. And then uh, <laughs> we went and played, <clears throat> went and played the, another school from down the road and got pumped by about fifty points. <laughs> so that was a lesson, wasn't it? Oh, mate, yeah. We, but all... we were a big fish in little pond, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's mate. We, I know quite a few coaches that have been through, and I've been through that as well, mate. You know, yeah, yeah. Think, thinking you thinking you're up, uh, you're thinking you're the next national coach, and then your bubble bursts real quick. <laughs> yeah, it's a... um. How during that um journey that you've been on, mate, at, uh, as a coach, and of course we're always learning. Um, what's a heartbreak or a disappointment that you can share? Um, and the reason I ask is because we've all had them as coaches, mm. and I think a lot of the times in the early days we have those setbacks, disappointments. And a lot of coaches will just go, no, nope, that's it. I'm not good enough, whatever. And they throw their toys out of the cot and they walk away. Mm. But the good coaches go, yeah, that was pretty crap. But what have I learned from that? And yeah, you know, it, it makes us better coaches. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting that question, eh? Because <clears throat> the first thing that comes to mind is um, there's losses and things, you know, your team's lost games and lost competitions or got to a final and haven't won it. Um, and you sort of remember all those moments, but then when you really dig deeper, it's probably not really a disappointment because it's really attached to your ego, isn't it? So I think probably the biggest one for me was, um, I don't know if it was a disappointment, but the biggest learning curve I had was coaching um, at a local provincial women's team and I was uh, sevens team <coughs> and we were coaching um, with another lady who's awesome. Anyway, long story short, she had to pull out because of um, family reasons. And then... Um, New new coach just been appointed as head of head of women's rugby. Um, decided that he'd he'd jump in and take over, and I'd stay as assistant. But he brought two other coaches with him, and that was sort of back end of a pretty full on provincial fifteen side men's comp. And um, yeah, it just never worked. It really just it just clicked. It got got to um in a selection meeting, and um we had a and I was going through this grappling with a some you know some uh, personal challenges such as. Um, I'm not one of the personal challenges, some stuff around um ability to be, I guess, courageous and brave and have tough conversations with people. So yeah. I sort of avoid them and skirt around them and and, and dwell on it. <clears throat> and so in the selection meeting, and I um I've, I've, I've raised my <laughs> raised my um opinion on a player. We're going to select the twelfth player for this tournament, and then it all sort of kicked off from there and um sort of all all bubbled to the surface. And I uh, between myself and the head coach who actually to be honest I had a really good relationship with and still do um, but this sort of moment in time not so good so he, he, next day we caught up and he he hadn't he hadn't slept and he was all stressed out about it so I ended up um, uh, stepping aside and I said look I'll, I'll um, yeah I'll pull out mate I'm, I'm I'm creating too much stress for you we haven't kind of connected what's best for me what's best for you and the team is that I um, I, I step aside and, um, and, and, and so I did and a couple of weeks out from nationals and just, just to give them that space, but I guess the learning, the learning was, um, I guess how you, how you deliver, uh, <laughs> how you deliver that those kind of conversations. So, in hindsight, I should have probably said, uh, you know, um, 
hey, do you mind if I give my opinion on this or um, feedback? And also that real alignment around um, a right alignment with your coaching crew. Um, it's massive, massive for me now. Like that's that's a disappointment or heartbreak. Yes and no. Um, disappointed that I couldn't couldn't complete the campaign, but I had to sit back and it was bloody hard because <clears throat> and, and actually go, what's best for the team and what's best for the coaching group? And I and I thought at that time it was for me to step out. Um, there were, you know, there were still three of them there to go, but it was a bloody, um, pretty challenging, challenging uh, month or six weeks, um, yeah, to go through that. And, you know, you're worried about, yeah, what people think of you and they think you're a quitter and all that kind of stuff, but you had to stay true to your values. But then, yeah, the learning round pack from it was pretty awesome. <clears throat> um, yeah. And, and, and now, now that, that sort of dictates everything around how I'm looking for, um, what, what to get out of coaching. And for me, it's not, what team I'm going to coach or what uh, what level or grade it's it's the people you got around you that makes it and we don't want everyone to be the think the same in that but you got to be massively aligned with your values and how you how you approach things I reckon um, um, that's an awesome club season I've just had with these two up up and coming coaches and that was the appeal and we had really good growth as individuals real open I guess the word vulnerability is um, sprouted around a lot in the moment but it was like that we had um you know, we didn't know everything. We support each other in other areas. Um, we had robust discussions, you know, and we worked hard together and it was bloody real fun. Like I really look forward to going to training every week where campaign I was just talking about before, I, I was dreading trainings and stuff, you know. So it's, that's probably, probably the, probably the biggest, biggest one I've had. And that, and that kind of transcends into other areas of life, you know, like working with in a, in a work environment, or relationships you've got, um, yeah, the learnings I got from that was was pretty massive. Um, because I'm probably a guy who likes to grapple with things and challenge things and test things a bit. Um, but you gotta do it tactfully, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's a good point, mate. Like we've all been in situations where um whether it's yourself or someone else in the coaching team or the team itself just doesn't fit. Doesn't mean they're a bad person, you're a bad, they just don't fit either what you're trying to achieve or the dy- or the dynamics or you know and yeah I've got I've got mates that I would never coach with because I just know that <laughs> you know like good blokes and all that but we would just yeah it just wouldn't it just wouldn't work and that's not saying you know you're a bad coach I'm a bad coach we just don't work together well yeah yeah 100% um mm. absolutely I think yeah and the interesting thing with being colleagues with this guy and he's we like mate we were good and he's a real wise council fellow like we got a real good just this particular moment in time i think there's so much going on and and uh within things but um that's massive and you don't want as i said don't want everyone to be the same but um like for example i'm a bit of a more uh fun loving kind of guy and like to get people up and quite extroverted and where i like to i need someone in the coaching group that's the opposite you know someone that can yeah. you know be gruff and you know give give the team a spray if they need or you know, can do that. But, you know, you know, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, difference because you don't want to all be the same either. But yeah, morally you need to, I think you need to have, um, yeah, be connected around that. Um, the values that you hold and how you, how, I reckon how you engage with each other. I'm, you know, I'm big on um, positive affirmation and building people up and, and getting the, trying to get the best out of people. And I, and I you know, I thrive on the, on the same back. Um, which is, you know, it can be a weakness as well. So you gotta, yeah. So if you can get get that get that around you, then yeah, yeah, it will be uh, it'll be it'll be a happy days. But yeah, no, that's some good some good insight there, mate. Um, so let's turn that around, mate. What's some of the highlights that you had? Because the highlights outweigh the bad. Otherwise, we wouldn't do what we do. Um, yeah, yeah. Um. So what's what's a highlight that you've had as a coach? Um, that sort of you might have got some learnings out of it as well, or just you know the good after the bad type stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's probably a few few that come to mind. Um, <clears throat> even just this year, we're talking about my high, <laughs> highlights were usually having a big bottle of beer on a Thursday night after training and <laughs> chewing, chewing the fat with uh, yeah. other other coaches and in the in some of the young fellas. Uh, but that was good. But I guess um you yeah, had probably probably a few good ones so when I was coaching my first probably more I guess you call it serious coaching stint. I was a young teacher at a high school over here and we um managed to um 
get the team to qualify for the uh, national touch tournament for the first time with the school had done it in mixed mixed touch. Actually, after that, I oh, went overseas and they they won the nationals a couple of years after that. But um, but yeah, I remember qualifying for that and we went to nine all and uh <laughs> went to nine all full time. We had to win to guarantee and went to a drop off. You know, drop off for those people that know is um you have six on the field and then an extra time and touch you um drop a player off every two minutes and we got down to three on three you know full field and we managed to defend our line for like um a full set of six or three people then we they turned it over and we made a couple of quick subs and went down and scored and I remember the um the feeling of you know we've qualified was pretty amazing um another one was probably the first of the end coach in England and it's called a school called the Perth School in Cambridge, and I came really, really connected to that people that place. Um, we I was head of year, and I had this group come through for uh, three years. Of actually, the school went co-ed, but they were the last all boys group. Um, so I was really close with them and their parents and all that stuff. But we coached the first fifteen, and we had this local derby against this, uh, this school called the Lees. And in all my time, I coached there. Never had a, never had a um, one of the t- senior teams I'd coached. Never um never beat the Leeds actually so we same thing we had the last game the very last game I was in the uh, coaching the first thing which I didn't know it was going to be at the time because just after that we found out my wife was pregnant and we came home to New Zealand but um, just remember being in the huddle after that last game and a few of the boys spoke and I sp- and I couldn't really get any words out and I put my head down and a few tears came out and just you know the the emotional connection you had to these, these young young fellows and, and, and the way these uh, senior boys especially they had grown through the season and started taking ownership of the team and leading it themselves. And I just saw, you know, because I had this story when we halfway through the season, we turned up to this training ground and we, uh, I went and I was getting, I was sort of driving all the energy of this team and I thought, shit, I can't do this forever. I need to let these boys lead a bit more. So it's sort of right. I'm not going to, um, I'm going to sort themselves out in the bus. They're going to put all the equipment on. I made sure the jerseys went on, but none of the balls and bibs and cones went on. So they got to the ground because that was their job to do it all, but they weren't. They got to the ground. Hey, sir, um, where's the bag of balls? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, mate. Where are they? Have you did you put them on the bus? I didn't put them on the bus, you know. Anyway, they went and found this little size three rugby ball and warmed up with it. Um, and we had this big debrief on the way home. I said, you guys need to, you know, it's about time you guys took control. I'm the one driving all the energy, I'm the one sorting it all out. They did. Next training, I turned up, they were there 10 minutes early, sorting themselves out. Second to last game, one of the about to jump in the huddle at half time and the the captain goes sir i've got this (laughs) and uh (laughs) get me out of the huddle and i was like that for me was success eh? that was like boom and then week after we played that last game and just to see how they grew you know it was it was pretty um pretty special um yeah that was that was that's real fond memories i still stay in touch with some of those those guys as well it was 10 years ago um they're all in in england had one of them actually come through in a camper van a few years ago and stay and that's pretty special um and probably the other one is probably a big, big one, and it's probably links back to what I was talking about earlier around coach the New Zealand secondary school sevens team, and um, well, called the Condor sevens team, uh, playing the world schools. Um, actually, we tipped up Australia in the semis, mate. We bloody gave them a telling. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, that was only a week long campaign, but we had this just a real awesome. You know, they short campaigns. You can do a little bit. Mm-hmm. They feel a bit different. You, know, you can create a bit more excitement. But a really awesome head coach a guy called Hayden Reed who um, used to play for the All Black Sevens um, for a number of years. In fact, Gordon Titchens writes in his book how um, much of a legend he is. He, um, Rido would, would you know, be the number one trainer, and the story goes that he ended up um, needing to go to hospital one day and had a, and he'd be on a drip because he, he, he emptied the tank in training and old um, Titch um, goes to the hospital and, yeah, Rido, you're right for the trial today. <laughs> he goes, yeah, rip, rip the, um, rip the uh, cord out of his um in hospital went back to training and um played this trial game but he pretty much collapsed at half time but um to, uh, Gordon Titchens went yep he's the guy for us and he ended up playing five years for the All Black Sevens but you know he was a head coach and he just a real massively empowering fella and he made, he made you feel like uh you know 10 foot high and bulletproof and the boys felt the same and the coaches were at our roles and it was just a real special week around learning around um leadership and theming and and how to empower and inspire people around you, and and um, so those were there was probably a, a few a few memories that come to mind. Um, but more recently, mate, big bottles on a Thursday night. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, and sometimes they're the, they're the good moments, just sitting around having a beer and a chat and connecting with players and people, and yeah, and like you yeah, said, I agree, Billy. I think those... it's um, yeah, 
I'm quite, I, um, I'm big on that whole, um, you know, we've gone probably a little bit, you know, a little bit PC and stuff like that. But there's a, there's a, there's a place in for women and men, and I'm obviously coaching the men's space. But for men to actually, you know, get around with another group of men and talk rubbish and connect and have have some purpose, you know, they get get away from their work environment, um, catch up with mates, talk rubbish, go home. It's all, you know, it's all above board, and most of the guys don't have to have a beer them whatever. For the drink, but it's a. I reckon coaches can capture that stuff. Really important. Um, obviously, it looks different when you're in youth youth space, but you know you don't have alcohol involved, hopefully. Um, but <laughs> finding ways for people just to connect, I think, and face to face in person, not off devices. Um, it's, yeah, it's massively important, I reckon. But yeah, and it's it's a good thing to remember too that. Um, like in the senior space, these guys are coming from work. They might have yeah. had a long day on the tools, got a shit boss. You know, they just want to have a bit of, you know, let some energy off, have a sit around, yep. talk to some mates, go home. Youth, youth the same. They could be coming from school. You know, they've got exams or, you know, whatever. And it just gives them that opportunity to blow off some steam, have a yarn to someone. Like you said, just talk rubbish for... 20 minutes after training just to yeah. and go home feeling better. 100%. Yeah. And that's, no, that was exactly the same for me. Like, I work from home. So, you know, um, it's good to get out and connect and get out of the caravan, mate, the old yeah. caravan office and um, mix it up with other, other, other people, you know, and um, especially if you're, especially if that floats your boat. Um, yeah. I, I think it's massive for me to talk about, you know, Pathways to high performance. Ninety-eight, ninety-nine percent of those club guys aren't gonna aren't gonna um, get to that level because either a they're not good enough, or b they don't work hard enough because they actually you know, they really dig, dig dig deep and you know and if they're really dedicated, some of them would, but they're not gonna do it. So what do they want? They want to hang it same as buddy kids, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they want to hang out their mates. That's why we go camping with friends. That's why we have, get people around for dinners. <laughs> It's yeah. the same. Yeah, and I, I remember many, many years ago when I was oh, in my early early to mid twenties, I played cricket with this guy. And he he could have been like he was just one of those freaks at sport. Yeah. And he was playing like fifth division cricket. And they kept saying to him, You can't keep playing this, like you're scoring a hundred every week and taking six <laughs> wickets and and he goes yeah, but I'm playing with my mates. And they went, oh, we're going to make you play first grade. Yes, I won't turn up. Yeah, yeah, he goes, yeah. He goes, it's not about, and like you could see him, like, yeah, he was scoring a lot of runs and that, but he was having fun. Like, yeah, he was just, yeah, like he'd go, oh, he'd go right back wherever you want. He goes, I just want to hang out with my mates. He just go, and you look back, you go, mate, you're an idiot because you could have been whatever. But you look back now and you go, you know what? He got it right. He just was there, there for a good time, you know? Yeah. So it's fair to understand what people's motives are, right? Eh? And yeah, um, it's all right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It takes, a special, uh, it takes a special type of character to really crack that top top level. Um, you know, you've got to be talented, then we've got to have the, the drive and work ethic, um, and commitment. You got to give up stuff, you know, to do it. And mm. uh, most these young guys don't want to do that, so it's that's all right. Yeah, exactly. That's not yeah. what they want to do. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've already talked about some lessons that, that you've learned. So we'll, and this is what I really want to delve into with you, mate, because I, I know a lot of the stuff that you do. Um, so in that training environment, um, at whatever sport it is that you're working with, um, you've got a potential elite player that's going to go on to play age grade rep or, or whatever. And you've got an athlete, his best mate comes along to play, never played the game before can't catch a cold in the middle of winter. Um, you know, all, we've, we've seen all those players, but you've got to you've got to develop the guy that's not so good so that he mm. continues to play because he's probably going to be the club president or the major sponsor or, you know, that the guy that's always there filling water bottles, running what whatever that situation is. Like, but also keeping that potential elite player engaged so that they can fulfill their potential as well so what do your training sessions look like when you've got those types of athletes yeah good question i think it's probably the most asked question i get in my role is how do you cater to different ability mm. levels 
And side note, you Aussies have always got good little sayings, haven't you? What's that one? Um, couldn't catch a cold in the middle of winter. They like can't, that. Ca- can't catch a cold in the middle of winter. <laughs> you, you can yeah, use yeah. that, mate. Yeah, you can use that one. I'll, 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 uh, I'll quote you. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's some, that's a good question. There's, there's lots of um, just different ways and sometimes the theory and the reality is a little bit different. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, good guy. Good guy. Just chuck him in a program somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> So what it look like at club land, which that's probably um, a good example. We've got um, get a couple of guys in this local steamers team, really dedicated. Um, they're actually in a in a in a program and they're playing club club footy as well. So one of the challenges I think we had this year was around um, their their workload and understanding and the guys in the academy programs that are in that um, understanding what their workload looks like, um, what their uh, how they not just their training, but also their workflow as far as the ana- analysis, key messages they're getting from people. Where there was a big gap this year. We said, oh, shit, well, we're giving them feedback on this. Um, is it aligned to what the provincial guys are saying? So we had a, we had a good sit down with the academy manager and to get that, and they identified they actually had a gap with it as well. So so I guess that's that um that high-end connection there. But and then the, as far as when you're within your own team environment, um, and I know it's different, not all ages have that. I think you still um uh, with those those the more experienced guys and stuff, you can use them as sort of leaders and mentors. It's probably one of the easier ways. Um I've got I find I find that if you don't get the uh find if you don't get the um the top guys on board, um it's necessarily people look to the more talented players for guidance. It's just sort of how it naturally works, you know, even if they don't want that sort of attention, yeah, they'll People will look to them anyway because they're skillful, talented, or got a bit of ability. So get them on board. So that was probably some good learning I had this year. If I was going to deliver a message to the team, I was coaching the defense. There was a key guy I had to get on board with it beforehand. So that would involve conversation before the training. Uh, sorry, before the training prior. I'm going to deliver this content next week. Uh, what do you reckon? Give me some feedback. And then might involve a phone call a couple of times with that. Um, quick catch up, you know, that stuff, getting them on board. So that, and then, and then, and then using them to help the people around them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So essentially, using using you you push you stretching those guys at the top around their leadership skills and the ability to guess, guess coach others around them. And we we were having meetings with our leadership team every um, Tuesday and started with um, the start of the season. They're always finding problems in the way they're playing or problems in other players. And we got to a point where we said, right, let's stop putting the finger at the way we're playing and the way we're. Um, and other people on the team, we started getting to point the finger in. We were doing the same as coaches. We think we got this. We did this well last week. We thought we did this poorly. We're going to prove. And then that changed, changed, changed it slightly. But anyway, you start using them, um, and then the more, and then, and we start identifying guys. You know, like anyone on this team, you reckon are not quite fitting in, or we need a bit of support, put us a bit of support around. Um, that kind of stuff. You know, getting guys that are new to the environment. How do you think they're fitting in? We're having those conversations, connecting with them. And then I guess the old ability-wise is actually, you're playing a team sport, rugby, you're trying to play a certain certain way. You've got to just get in and know your, know, know your role. And with this, this, and then within that, you've got, I guess, uh, shit, some guys that can execute things that others can't. So you maybe give them a little bit more license and you can implement it into your game plan. So we, well, yeah, for example, had um sort of tweaked things at the end of this year. We went, right, we've got, we had a really good um, center and winger. So we started using them off our set piece and using them more wisely. And then if, but if they weren't playing, then we wouldn't use those strike moves, for example. So there's all that kind of stuff to consider. So you, your profile, but then I guess, and this is in theory, this is easier than in practical, but trying to find ways to help each individual um, with your own development pathway. But shit, man, it's hard. Eh? I don't know if you find Billy, but um, in, in a, full-time environment when I was academy manager I'd sit down individually with these guys we'd have you know 20 minute reviews of the game they'd come and present stuff to me blah 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 we'd have gym sessions we'd do skill blocks we'd be real intimate with them but club land man they like drive up walk up at six o'clock and your buddy started at quarter past six yeah um and I'm bloody father of three boys so I'd quickly make dinner at five eat dinner with them get on the road because that's that's not it's like a non-negotiable in our family is that I'm not I'm not um I'm going to connect with the my kids and my, my wife before I leave and make sure everything's in, in order, but make sure that, um, you know, I'll help with dinner and all that stuff so that when we, um, I can go and do my hobby with not stressing out 
my wife and kids. So you're sort of rocking up and then you're yeah, trying to trying to connect with guys and sometimes that time's really short and then we start pushing training back to 6 30, cool. Then we've got some time to connect with guys individually and have those chats. Um so structuring that in, but easier said than done, mate. Yeah, I, oh, <laughs> and I don't I, know if I bloody answered your question because no, I don't no, know. No. It's and, and that's why I ask coaches because like you said, it's easy to go, oh, we're just gonna do this, this, and this. But you know, like you said, they get there at six, you start at quarter past six, or you know, they might get there right on start time, and you might be the only coach at a club. You know, there's all these variables, but just trying to keep them, like you said, keep everyone connected and yeah, and, grow, the, and grow them and encourage and just the kids we yeah, kids we did a lot of um peer peer teaching. Yep. Um they got um okay if you really well, sometimes we'd get more experience with less experience and they teach each other tackling and sometimes we'd, we'd actually subtly stream them into ability too so they'd have some of the uh lesser confident kids would maybe do activities when they're walking instead of running and the more confident kids are doing it more full on and they're stretching their skills set um but it's probably something always to reflect on eh? it's what are, what are most most of your listeners what sort of um what sort of grade are they normally? Is it called Clubland or? Yeah, um, majority club is Clubland, mate. So, so adult club. Yeah, and June and youth and June, like that yeah. underage, underage stuff. So mm, that's what's um, good to have um, good other people supporting in your coaching environment, eh? so you can all yeah, um, yeah. have your little areas and you can support the players. But I also think if you set up a really good training environment and the training's uh, practice environment is well designed, players are going to improve through the design um, um, and also just by playing the game, they'll probably get better as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a really good segue, mate, for the next bit about playing games. Um, developing players through games at training. I know this is a thing that you're massive on. Um, yeah. Just want to give give the guys that are listening just a, you know, how, how does it work for you? What does it look like um, for guys that it's everyone's saying now, everyone's swinging towards the game based stuff. Um, and I just hope we don't do what we normally do is just go all this way and then all that way. And we never find that, that happy medium. Yeah. yeah. Um, Cause there's some aspects of the game that we have to teach as a closed skill and then extend it into that, that game base. So we can't have everything as a game at training um, in a lot of circumstances, but get, it's getting the mix. It's getting the, for me, it's about getting the the mix right between closed skills and then that, that game scenario, game sense stuff. So what's your thoughts around it, mate? Um, yeah, it's got, I'll probably um, spin out for a cup of tea and a scone with my darling wife date morning just before and, <laughs> It had a date scone actually. It's good, good little pun there. And um, I was talking about we're coming on this um podcast, and I've probably asked about this. And what I've done in the past is it's been quite theoretical, I guess. And I, what we've sort of what I've learned over the past, so I've just done just compared my masters in this and did game sense, and we had a couple of teams, and I read probably hundred research articles on it, and running a forty thousand word thesis, and got a got a bloody new app, and I've got fifty or sixty videos that coaches can use blah 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 so i'm real deep in it but what it's um often is it's just like almost like this um uh what's this this theory that sort of sits separate to everything so yeah it's like so when i used to run uh, the local small blacks courses all right how do we coach the tackle and then we'd often they'll come up with drills and stuff and how do we coach the ruck and then okay and now we're gonna do game-based stuff and then and then one day i was sort of coordinating this group of uh RDOs from around the country to design the small blacks course and Ross Filippo you now coaching Waikato he's a good man he said well why don't you just integrate it into everything so if you're going to coach tackling then the next question is okay how do you turn into a game or that, you know, that big shift so it's essentially just integrated to everything but the, the and it's not just not just about playing games it's well which essentially essentially the, the basis is we're trying to get players to learn in context as much as possible so learning, uh, one way mm. might be to play a game. So let's say um, well, we could probably, because you've got a, mostly a rugby audience in club land, um, I was coaching defence this year for the club. So we first went, right, okay, so how do we want to defend? All right. How how um, how much detail do you want this stuff, mate? Because um, uh, uh, there's an, 
of it and talk about some of the technicalities of, of the Mate, yeah, go, go, <laughs> Let's go where it leads us. Um, okay, so big big level picture, we decided, um, I did through the analysis I did of club, club rugby and the year before, we found that um, we were getting breached out wide the season before. They, they put lots of guys into the ruck. They're putting three in, tackler, assist, and a hunter from inside. So they're burning lots of guys at the ruck. So we're right, we're going to change it. The philosophy is it's all about turning the ball over and attacking from defense, which looks like the analysis was getting the ball kicked to us a lot. So we're going to do a lot of transition play from defense to attack. We're going to fill the field with more defenders. So we're going to have our winger um, floating slightly so that he can get back to counter attack, which means now in our tackle setup, we've got one tackler and, an, and a checker, we called him. And he would essentially just help, but then he'd try and get out. And then he'd make a decision whether he hunted and had a crack at the ball on the ground. So then that sort of framed everything. Um, we started learning too that whether we're going to um, get guys folding around the corner, they had a two-fold policy, right? So they had a ruck and then two guys would naturally fold, but they became so robotic at it and, and we get skinned on the short side a lot. So then we went, right, what we're going to do now is we're going to, so I'm going to get into my points around how we trained it. Okay, so the big high-level philosophy was, right, we're going to count from the short side because that's the easiest way. So if I've got um, so I've got one on the short side, we always had a minimum of two on the short side. But if I've got two, we match them with two. If they've got three, we match them with three, etc. And if we've got too many, if we've got if they've got none and we've got four, then we'll fold two around. We'll fold two around the corner and we'll hold two. So that's cool. So we get that big picture. Now we go, okay, so now we need to train this under duress and under pressure. So we we do things like we play games like um if if they had a, um, if they had a, a miss, a overlap on the short side, we'd give them incentive. So, for example, if the attack could hit an overlap, we'd let them have a free ten meters. Or if, um, if or if they didn't, if the defense had a matched up, we'd give them a little punishment like two burpees or something. Um, we'd do things like with an hour, we'd do lots of kick counter games because we wanted to, and we'd have a we had a rule a policy around four behind the ball. So we're on defense, boom! How quickly can we? transition into counter-attack. So we'd play games like kick-counter games. So we'd have, all right, for this game, and we wanted ball-and-play stuff, which is half the game, is um, it's you got to, like, train and get used to it. So, right, the rule of this game is you can have one ruck inside your half, and then you've got to get it out of there. So they generally kick it. So then the rule would promote kicking. And there's shitloads of kicking in senior rugby, we found out. Mm. Um so they play that rule. So then I kick, and then we'll start. Now we've got counter attack options, and then they'd have a ruck, and then now I've got to kick it, and it's going back and forth. Like, so look and feels looks and feels like what's going to be on Saturday, and then we'd stop them and go, all right, okay, when that ruck back, that's going back. We'll have a chat. How can we get um, how can we uh, get more behind the ball? Um, what's our policy, guys? Four behind the ball, good. How can we get that happening? And they go, oh, we just need to work harder. Cool. What kind of lines are you going to run? And we start talking about efficient lines and running straight lines to fill the field um, and st stuff like that. So they start unpacking it and then it'll match to the analysis we did on um, Saturday. So I'd code every time we got it kicked, I'd pause it when they got the ball. How many behind the ball? Okay, we this time we had four. Awesome. Tick. What's the outcome of it? Oh, we got gain line. We then breached off the second phase. Perfect. We got two behind the ball. What's the outcome? Oh, we had to kick it back to them because we didn't have an option. So, so I guess it was like high level philosophy around how we're going to defend. Um, and then we sort of matched the, the training environment and we came up with games, but also a little, and that was like ball and play stuff. And then we'd do things like called jackal touch. We would have the hunter, we could have people hunting for the ball. So then they would start, you know, there'd be turnovers at ruck time and there'd be decision-making happening. And, you know, it, would, it might be whole game or we might have rules around the ruck or we might do little activities like four on four or all sorts of stuff going on. Um, but essentially, it was around how we train in context as much as possible. Um, yeah, so that was that was, I guess, um, some of it. And then, then, then within that, and you'd mentioned before about the closed skill stuff, we implemented because um, most people that think oh, I'm in la la land say, so, "Well, Kyle, you're just so all game based, just down the end of the spectrum." And I say to them, "Well, you show me any evidence that suggests that doing closed technical drills in isolation helps helps your performance." Because the answer is we're there. We haven't found any research to show that, but we have we have seen research. If you if you train in context, you'll you'll more likely to improve in the game situation. So it just makes total sense to me. Um, so I haven't I haven't had it convinced, but 
there might be some psychological stuff going on, right? So the guy player goes, oh, I haven't done any tackling practice. I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable. Oh, I really need to do some, I really want to do some closed activities. Cool. The player, it's player centered. The player feels that they need that. Cool, put it in. So what did that look like for us this year? Our tackle policy was chopping, rightly or wrongly. We wanted to chop to get them on the ground so we could turn ball over. So then we did five minutes of chopping every Tuesday, which was in a with peers, 50 or 30 or 40, 50%, just going through three or four on each shoulder, tackling up, tackling up, bit of maintenance, and we're just going around. And But it wasn't in a closed drill. It was they were working in pairs, sort of sporadically, giving each other feedback, how that feel. And I'm asking them, cool, you've made a tackle. How can you get back to your feet quicker, back in the game, et cetera? Um, yeah, so some big picture stuff around how you're going to, where we're going to defend, how we're going to counterattack, and then some small picture stuff around the tackle um, and some detail. And then then you've got bloody set piece, mate. <laughs> like, what do your setups look like on? What do your setups look like on line out? How are you going to defend the back of the line out? How, how, what happens if it's a midfield scrum? What are you going to do? What's your connection with your six, eight, six, seven, eight? Well, that's cool. So we'd go five minutes every every week doing our seam, we'll call it seam connection. Yeah. So we get our, our Lucy's for scrum time and our nines and our tens. Okay, run through a couple of scenarios. Cool. Have conversations, but that gets live oppositions. Back of the line out, we had some funny stuff. We just tried some funny stuff at the back. We had our winger at the back of the line out instead of the hooker. We had this theory that we're going to steal heaps of ball and um, our winger, we'd be at the back of the line out to a counter attack. But um, and we had a really good, really, really good hookers to jackal. Most traffic was coming. So, bro, if I'm losing you, <laughs> all the listeners are tuned out now. In club land, basically line out, throw to 12, crash it up, same way. That's like a massive theme, right? Awesome. Yeah. That's a theme we see. Cool. We're going to set up a plan for that defensively, which means we're going to have our seven and our hooker um, at the 10 meter line because that's where all the traffic's coming. Now, they win the race to the gain line. They're our best tacklers. They're our best jacklers. They're on the ball. And then our, um, well, Winger was at the back for um for tip offs, which worked in preseason and then never really happened again. But um, um, but you know what I mean? So like lot lots going on, but then when we come to the what we've analyzed it, how we want to play, now we need to train it in context. Yeah, yeah, okay, that makes sense to me. <laughs> no, it does, it does. So it's sort of yeah, and I think when I when I talk about closed skills, it's those one on one tackle drills and 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 that type of stuff that 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 because I do a lot of set piece stuff, so it's like the line out throws and the lifts yeah, yeah. And, and that stuff. Um, but I also don't. I very rarely uh, in season do static. Like even if we do a line out, there's attack and defence. Good. Um, we might, you know, we always do a, a bit of a warm up for scrum time, just a bit of one on one stuff, and then it's. Full, you know, yeah, and we that? might and we might do three scrums. I said, oh, I want three good scrums. That's all I want. Bang, and we're away, and we move on to something else. Well, that's a good example of game sense. So that's yeah. the training in context, and that's what we've got to also understand too. Within rugby, there's different skills. Like for example, the scrum, which is the game stops. It's um, yeah, you can have you need. Well, I'm no expert, mate, but it looks like for me, there's a bit of pushing, a bit of pulling, a bit of uh, boring in. There's different angles happening, and the more the players can experience and deal with that, the better. As opposed to scrum, well, traditional scrum machines, and I'm same thing. I've never been, never put my head in one of them, mate. But they don't get to push back, or they're like tackle one of my bags. My colleagues have got they're, one. They're like ta- they're like tackle bags, mate. They're good to, for a few things, but like you yes. said, they don't hit back. They don't yeah. drop their shoulder. They don't pull you around. They don't. Um, yeah, I'm. That's exactly the. I I, I reckon I get one out. I get ours out once a year twice a year um but it's and, it, and that's more around timings and um you know if, or if we're trying something new we'll, we'll get it out so we're not going full yeah. eight on eight type stuff well, it, so, yeah. well the research i did is i we had two teams that implemented a game sense approach they get trained in context all that kind of stuff i was just talking about before and i interviewed the players throughout the season and the front row has actually said that folks like um scrum machines are a waste of time it's way way better um way better learning if we're um yeah doing live stuff. It's way better lining if we, line out time if we're doing opposed line outs. It is funny in rugby yeah, we have these things like for example we do attack with no defenders often like run throughs right. So we do all this and that's got a place right. So when you're learning new stuff, learning new systems, you know it's got a place. But yeah, like ten minutes later they already know it. Let's put put it under stress because 
yeah, we can have the perfect one three three one shape. But guess what? It's bloody easy to defend because everyone knows what's going to happen. That's why I learned this year to go the defence coach. And then a couple of guys get pulled into that ruck or that gets a mess. It all changes anyway. Yeah. Um, so we need to like be able to cope with that. Um, I was just up at Black Ferns training two weeks ago. So I was shadowing um, Wayne Smith up there. And um, mm-hmm. he he's a big exponent of this. So their training, man, it's all in context. And they do a session um, – two days out from test match, full on, all GPSed up. They've got set of metrics they need to hit, distant, or it's a simple way of explaining speeds and distances is probably the easiest way to describe it. And um, they go full on for like, shit, it was about 45 minutes, an hour. And they've got all these scenarios, they throw them, they throw them, shit, yellow card, what are you going to do? Go. And that's full noise, man. And then they have little contact blocks on it. And the girls at the end are poked. They've probably worked harder than they would in a test match. But it's 15 on 15, exactly what I look and feel like in a match. And the and the growth that group's had is massive. Yeah. And I think that's a good point that you made right at the start of that, where whatever attack shape it is, one, three, one, two, four, whatever it is, we run that at training and it runs really well. In a game, something happens. Does the player know how to get back into that shape? What you know, and that's and that's the stuff where you can benefit from that training in context or game-based training, whatever language you want to use is, okay, it's broken down there. How do we get back to what we want to do? Yep. Because the coach isn't there to blow the whistle. You know? Um, Absolutely. And I leave, to... leave, leave the whistle in the pocket. That's the hard bit for us. Um, yeah. And I to deal to... with... Because over, over 50% of ball is from turnover. Like yeah. either from kicks... Well, with the front of your trend now, it's really hard to win ball on the ground, like jackling and hunting. <clears throat> so you, you're more likely to get a penalty than a than a clean turnover. But over well, at least half your ball is going to be from kicks, right? In men's rugby, um, yeah. and less less in women's. But um, lots of kicks. So where's that in your training? Like, are you like I was talking about before, transition from defense to counter attack? Yeah, I mean that's a massive part of the game. So the more you can, like, it's half your game. Like you got to train it. But I'll tell you what, a lot of probably not people listening to this bully, they're well educated people, but they'll be spending often 80 or 90% of their time practicing strike moves from scrum and line out, run three phases, blow the whistle, start again, do it again. And that's your against no opposition. Like, doesn't make sense. <laughs> mm, yeah. Mate, I've been guilty of that. <laughs> we've all been there <laughs> yeah oh and and that's the thing mate like we, we talk about this stuff now and, and i say to young coaches i say mate i've done what you've done i've made my you know i, I was one of those guys that training had to look perfect you know yeah. no drop ball and now it's like the uglier it looks the better <laughs> yeah yeah you know because that's what rugby is it's it's an ugly game of you know chaos and turnovers and bad bad bounces and referees making a a decision that could have gone either way. And, you know, there's all these things that happen that we often don't the, train for. Yeah, that's right. And then the skill of the coach is to sort of help players navigate that because I've had the opposite happen. So we, as you said about the continuum, so I've had real controllable and now, oh, it was messy and chaos. And then the players are going, man, we're not getting any, we're not learning, we're not getting better. But if they don't understand why they're doing it, so guys, what we're going to do in this is, I'm not going to blow the whistle, if turnovers, play on, if there's mistakes happen, just play on. We'll unpack it. Mistakes are good. If there's a few mistakes, it's pretty good. We'll we'll get the learning from it. And they go, oh, yeah, sweet, and off they go. But if they don't know why they're doing it, then, you know. Um, so it's really important for the the why behind it um, <clears throat> to be really well communicated because they'll barely switch off. I mean, people may ask me, how'd you go doing, you know, game sense approach with senior club guys? And I said, well, um, good. I mean, they were used to it. The, the two guys that were um, coached them beforehand, they're big on it. And one of them's um now coaching steamers, doing really well, ex-professional player, played played in France, and he's a big exponent of it. And he's a prop. And he said, best way to learn, boys, is this. And they were like, Yep, sweet, off we go. <laughs> Can yeah. You yeah, and that's it. Like I think if you and if you're at a club, you know, you're at a new club or or you want to start doing this stuff at at the club you're at, if you explain it to them, because it might take them a week or two weeks to sort of go, mate, this guy's crazy. Oh, probably but if three you, years. <laughs> but if you do it and then you go into, you know, the bigger picture stuff and then you come back and you say, remember that drill we did, you know, where it looked really ugly. 
that's exactly what just happened. And like I said, making that context and making giving them that picture of this is why we're doing it. We're happy to do that, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, like you said, mate, the, the biggest why. way. Yeah, why, yeah are we, why are we doing it? And then if if that, let's say, dr drill's a dirty word, right? So you, you have to do 10 press-ups now, Bully, but it's all right. Um, so yes. let's say it's an ex I, <laughs> I, drill. I, everyone I uses use, the word drill, so I'm I use the, fighting I a losing use, battle. <laughs> I use the word, I'm, I'm trying to use the word activity. Yeah, there we go. More and more, but I know <laughs> I say that to some people and they just go, what? So it sort yeah, of yeah, right. depends who I'm talking to. Um, I think it's for kids. Yeah, it's an activity. It's a gut like, yeah, we're going to go and play a game. And they look at you and you just go, don't worry about it. Yeah. A, and then my boys just go, I had a team once and they just said, can we play touch? And I go, yep. And they go, oh, what are the rules? Because they just knew <laughs> I would just, and I'd change the rules halfway through and they're just like, yeah. mm -hmm. but once they got used to it, it was, it, they loved it. So Yeah, I think activities or drills, if you're going to take, isolated away from a bigger picture game then if you can make it look and feel like rugby then great so for example what happens a lot in um what happens a lot in senior club rugby at the moment if a team takes it to the edge they're nine times out of ten they're going to hit a pot off nine so that's going to happen a lot in the game very rarely you know some teams play off ten but most of them play off nine they all play the same way and that's really easy when you're a defense coach because you know what's coming so you can prepare for it so what do we do okay we're going to train this little part of it this is an edge ruck. Cool. What are they going to do off here? Oh, we're going to hit off nine. Cool. How are you going to set up? Good. Let's go. And then have a couple of those activities happening. And we did a, lot, did a fair bit of that at the start of the season to get them ready, you know. Then we get them tracking all right. So let's start there and let's run into position and sort our spacings out and stuff. And then, you know, that's going to happen a lot as opposed to um, a lot of defense we've done in the past. We do like um, all the activities, like our, our ruck set up, what do you call them? Guard your posts or your, whatever you want to call them, A's, B's, C's, whatever. Yeah. And then everyone does the same drill. And the wingers are like, uh, and the fullback, we had our fullback and 10 back. Fullback and 10 are like, oh, I'm probably never going to stand in that position. Why am I practicing that? Good point. Why don't you stand behind the line and organize them? What are you going to do on Saturday? So then that and the activity, get out of it. You're not going to be there. Go behind. You direct them. That's your role. Nines, what are you doing? You're, in the boot. You're directing the A's and B's. Boom. Practice that, not practice standing in the line. You know what I mean? Yeah. If, if that's your policy. So, yeah, this, this makes more bang for buck, you know? Like, shit. Yeah. And, you know, that, that bang for buck stuff, like, I don't know about you, mate, but I've never spoken to a coach that goes, oh, yeah, I've got enough time at training to do everything I need to do. <laughs> um, so, getting that. They say they need more time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, my my head coach doesn't ask me anymore how long do you want for scrums and lineouts because I said mate I'll take two hours if you want to give them to me I'll take them like <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You, you guys always need more <laughs> no mate we'll, we'll do it all day um but you tell me what I've got and then I'll design yeah, something yeah. around it but getting that bang for your buck is going yeah well that guy's never going to be in that position or if he is it might be once in you know yeah so yeah what why is the yeah. nine why is the nine in the bottom of that ruck or why is that 10 standing there when his role in even in an attack line, he's he's not going to be here. He's going to be you know your first receiver or yeah, yeah. wherever. So yeah, that that makes sense as well when you're looking at time efficiency. Hundred percent. Why why are we so, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Yeah, that was my one of my biggest um, grapples this year as a coach early on was so I came in as the third coach this year. They they worked as a pair. So the two other guys, awesome fellas. Worked as a collaborative lead for the last couple of years, but one was the forwards, one was backs, you know, pretty traditional. But then the one was attack, one was defense as well. So they had really clear roles. I came in. Now it's a little bit more difficult to manage the third coach when where you fit time in and all that. So I was struggling to get the flow of the week right. So the flow, I mean, okay, I'd analyze the game, do my stats, uh, clip a couple of things, really battled all season around how I can get that learning across, connect that learning from analysis to the players, but also. Okay, right. how much time do we actually need in a week to nail the critical? And after probably four or five games, I went, right, I've got a feel for it now. And I had a little template, which was I need uh, 35 minutes of defence a week, of which 20 minutes of it is fully led by me, um, or the defence team, um, really defensive focus. The rest of it is integrated into other areas. So when I was saying integrated, kick counter, um, so tr transitional that is integrated into game design we do that we're going to do game blocks um, 
set piece uh, seam work. We might do a little, I said a five minute little block, but that would then be integrated into our scenarios that we're doing against the development team, 15 on 15, or I'd have a chat to them and then we'd be looking at that. So it's a lot, line outs they're doing is his scrum and line out work. Cool. I need, while you guys are doing your line out, attacking line, you're doing live line outs, I need to borrow the winger and our halfback for five minutes, please. Boom. They just come in, get their seam sorted, boom, back to their, you know, back of stuff. So I'd encourage you said like, I heard Mike Cron talk about this on a podcast the other day. Every coach needs more time. In, doesn't mean if you're in a job, you need more time. Everyone wants more time, but you don't have more time. Write all the things down, circle the critical stuff, nail that, and just you have to live with the other stuff or integrate it and be clever. And you got, yeah, they got them for an hour. How can I work the whole time? Okay, it's not defensive time now, but I can still be helping players with defensive activities and ideas and having conversations, supporting my head coach, you know. So, well, lead coach, they stop using time as an excuse. <laughs> they yeah, say, yeah. Buddy, sort your shit out, team. <laughs> and that, and that's a good point, mate. Like we, we did a lot of it this year with us. Like when the attack coach was running his attack shape stuff, I'd be standing in the defensive line, getting the boys. You know, what are we doing here? What like? Good. It, it's, it's um, you know, how are we getting off the line? How's this? How even if it was touched, you know, you can still. Have your principles in there of you know how how are we going to get off the line? Where do we want these people? The only thing we're taking out of it is the actual tackle. Yeah. But everything and the and the first couple of times the boys just looked at me and then it was like no, well they like you said they they get an extra ten meters on you now. And yeah. Then all of a sudden the, the defense starts talking. I said if you turn that ball over, we're playing. Yeah. Then 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 it's like like you said then it's that game game within the game and you can. You know, we've got five minutes, but now we've just run attack and defense. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Absolutely. So I see get, getting that bang for your buck. In, but again, it's just having that coordination between the um, the attack and the defense. Often the attack coach will go, what are you doing? I said, well, mate, you sort your attack out. That they're not giving us the opportunity because my boys, my defensive team's going to try and get that ball off you. Yeah. But then it's a game between the two of us. Coach. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean, yeah, yeah. and then that's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the uh, yeah, yeah, but a bit of friendly banter between, yeah. Oh, bully, can you just tone your defense down, mate? We want to get our tax sorted, oh, okay, yeah, because your tax, <laughs> yeah, because your tax, not good, or, or whatever it is, yeah, 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 it's just, and then all of a sudden, you see the boys, they just they really buy into that as well, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, but we were always careful that we didn't always have, um, because we would trade our first and second grade together, so we wouldn't yeah. have. In some situations, we'd have first grade versus second grade, and then others, if we're playing like that attack D, we'd make sure we had like an even mix. Yeah. So they know that it's not like, oh, you know, we're not going to. So, yeah. It's just a bit. I think one of the challenges with with rugby is the contact part, isn't it? As you just alluded to around. Yeah. Often in these, in our game design, we get um, the defense will dominate the attack because obviously you don't have the collision. So, we haven't quite worked out worked out that yet. Um, that was one of the grapples through the research as well, and we're still working hard on how we can um, re- replicate the tackle without the tackle. If that makes sense. So, as in, yeah. how can we? So we've tried things like, for example, we're going to touch their knees instead of or touch their hips, or we're going to do shoulder on. Um, can be quite good if you get yourself, you know, shoulder under the ball, then it's a, it affects a touch. Or um, sevens do a lot of um, got to get two in the probably do some fifteens get two in the touch. So then it well you got to like yeah it's quite um it's quite a quite a challenge eh? But if people got good ideas out there and flick them through because we'll uh, we'll go and film them and help help <laughs> help people. Yeah. Um, yeah, because even when you like you do the two hand touch and the stuff like that, I'll I'll often let guys run through because yeah. the, the guys sort of stretched. I said, mate, there's no way you're making that tackle. You might have yeah. touched him, but you're not making that tackle. So play, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to replicate it without mm. the physical contact. Yeah. Yeah, some good guidelines of that. And then we're all bloody nervous about injuries. So um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. We had, an, we had 11, 11 game season this year and we had 39 players play. So there's real uh attrition rate was quite high. And um so you'd bloody never back line for we're changing our back lines all the time and just quite combative, you know, like um so you'd sort of 
trying to get the bang for buck for training, but you're also nervous about injuring guys. And we injured a couple of trainings. So you're like, shit, um, just, you know, a little bit, a little bit uh, unlucky probably, but um, you know, you got that in the back of your mind as a coach too. So yeah, a lot of other sports, um, you know, like netball and football and basketball, you can buddy go full noise pretty much. Pretty hard to do that in rugby. You can do it with your little kids, but we had a lot of, because they're not as combative, but once you had adolescents and you got secondary school kids and fully grown men that are strong and physical, you know, buddy, you can't only do so much. Yeah, and you've got to limit the time you do it as well. Like, yeah. You've got to do it in small block. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a, um, someone comes up with a solution, mate, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll do all right. Yeah, it's a, Mate, that was awesome. Um, just one last question, then I'll let you go. Um, thinking back to that first time that you started coaching um, way back when, if you could go back in time now, what advice would you give yourself in that first season as a coach <laughs> knowing what you know now? That's a good question. I hear that, I hear that question a lot, um, that given, given, to, given to people. Probably... Probably just chill out a bit. Yeah, nice. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, yeah. I think um, I've, I've had that answered by guys like Graham Henry and people like that, and they were real. They made well, Steve Hansen and guys like that have made massive shifts in their philosophy around. Um, they're really dictatorial, and now they're a bit more player centered. And they made big shifts in that. Um, we'll probably haven't made those kind of shifts massively, but. Um, as far as I was always probably he'd call it player centered and um fun loving guy, but I've talked about some of the learnings I've had around um yeah who you get around you. But probably when I was coaching that touch team I was talking about, I was pretty full on. I was a young single fella then and absorbed a lot of my thinking and time and I was, I was living on site at school too, so that was all all good. But um I remember one of the guys he was he was head boy, he was in the team and he had to go to some function and I was like Mate, we've got the buddy tuck in my mind. I'm thinking we've got touch training, you know, like this is like, do you have to really go to that function? Like, we've got nationals up in two weeks, yeah. And then, my the guy who sort of mentoring bit, we put him on as the manager, um, Andrew Douglas, great man. He's actually was coaching in the uh, in what's it called, uh, the American American League. He was MLR. coaching MLR, he was coaching there. He <clears> came <throat> on, he was director of sport at the school, and he came on and um, was the manager and sort of mentored me a bit without. You know officially, but I was, I was true to fat and get lots of tips from him. And um, he was massive on player relationships. And he just turned to me then and said, Cole, yeah, it's important for you, but is it important? You know, is it what's important for him? Yeah, and that, was, that was a good lesson. I thought, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Um, he's head boy, he's got a lot of pressure on him. It's actually really important that he fronts up to that kind of stuff we can do without him for a training, you know. Um, so probably, um, I had uh, yeah, big put so much time and energy as you do as coaches and. Well, probably just be a little bit more um understanding of that, but um that that'd be that'd be one thing I've learned. Um it's gone gone along and then yeah, probably lots of little little things as you go, but I probably um I've never never used the four corners drill, that's for sure. Um <laughs> at least a lot of I don't know. Yeah. I I, I have very, very long time ago. I uh, saw a Actually, I saw, I can't even remember who it was. It might have been a um, premier grade club here this year, warm up with it. And I just stood there and I just, I was just cringing. And the players going, what? I'm going, oh my God, they're still doing that. And they, they went, holy shit, I've seen that for, for years. I went, yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's, it's a, yeah. Well, I had, had a couple of people, uh, actually one guy said, Kyle, oh, you're, um, you're going to blow, you know, beautiful traditions in rugby. Four Corners is a beautiful tradition, mate. <laughs> I said, oh, you're probably right there. You know, it's got a bit of a retro feel to it. Do we need to keep four corners in? Have I gone too far? Because I'm all about, oh, how do we maximize engagement and learning and training context and all that? But maybe we need four corners, you know, just to keep keep the 80s alive. And, and they used to <laughs> and they used to call it the truck and trailer drill. And you'd go, Oh, truck and trailer. You know, and if like, you don't really? know it, you're, you're doing press-ups, mate. <laughs> and really, it, you're not allowed to truck and trailer. Like <laughs> Well, in in, uh, in netball, it's called cut the cabbage. The same thing. I did some work for netball New Zealand. Yeah, right. and that's that's rife through netball as well. Yeah, okay. Um, every sport has them. Uh, football has the stand a queue of kids up in front of the goal. Coach stands to the side, kicks the coach. Yeah, you know, kicks it back to the player, and they try and score a goal, and they go back to the queue. And I was like, 
my son's playing the social league at the moment and, and i was like ah every sport's got their little thing and looked around yeah, and all the, yeah, teams, all, yeah. the, all the teams were doing it i was like i text this guy from football and i said bro we've got some work to do mate <laughs> the funny thing was with that is before when they all turn up kids were just playing this game they were going awesome yeah it's actually really cool these kids have organized their own team they're called the black ninjas so year five, <laughs> they're, um, they're 10 11 year olds anyway these they all organize themselves right they just help them facilitate it and it's real good it's like rock up on a wednesday they had their first game and um they all fully fully uh sort themselves out playing this little game for it Coach comes in and gives him a cue. <laughs> oh. And then at half time, real good fellas though. The coach's are awesome dudes, giving them they're all giving their little bits of feedback. I'm standing on the peripheral. And then they're all like eyes sort of going everywhere. And then this one player goes, All right, boys, what we need is a diamond, one at the back, two on each side. It's five aside, one at the back, two on each side, and one up front. What's the goalie? And they went, Yep, sounds good. And they went and did it. <laughs> and the coaches are going watching, it's actually starting to work. I said, Yeah, man. Like. It's amazing what kids can do when they're given the chance, eh? Yeah. <laughs> so it was coach coach control, but um, <laughs> yeah, I thought that's quite funny. Mate, that is awesome. Um, where can people find you, mate, if they want to contact you through your coaching gig stuff? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, coachinggig.com. Kyle at the coachinggig.com. Um, probably this, well, I'm not sure if, well, we've got, I think when we first met Bully, um, we went to, um, doing some online stuff. I ran yeah. up online game game based coaching thing or webinar for four weeks. Then I learned around that this year we filmed heaps and we got a, had it on another platform. And at the moment we're in a in the place of um, creating an uh, the all in one stop one stop shop app for junior rugby coaches and hopefully secondary by next year. But that's really exciting and um, that'll be free and accessible for 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 coaches over there, um, provincial unions and clubs and stuff can personalize things and add things and cool. yeah that'll be um hopefully up, up and ready next year and um it's going to be a, it's pretty exciting it's just um a way of supporting coach supporting more supporting more coaches more often um because we know like these podcasts are good ideas because people can listen to it when and where they want um, the days mm-hmm. of traditional workshops are probably um but well, they still got a space but they need to think differently so i've invested yeah. most of my last two years trying to solve that problem um, so yeah, pretty excited about that. But yeah, if people want to get in touch and if they want any um got any um yeah, questions or thoughts or comments or solutions to some of our problems, um yeah, happy to happy to hear from them. Awesome. Mate, thanks very much. I have quite a few notes written down here, and I'm sure the listeners will take a heap away from this. Um mate, thanks for your time and your busy schedule. Um it's been great talking to you. Yeah, not too busy, mate. The only thing I had to put off today was I was going to go read a um, read a book to the kindy kids um, when I pick up my son, but uh, I said we'll have to postpone that to next week. Oh, just, blame, <laughs> just blame me, mate. Everyone else does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I'd rather talk rugby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, mate. Awesome. Thanks for your time. Who's up their own ball? That is